Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be going over the two knights defense. After e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6, bishop c4, knight of six, we have the two knights defense. And specifically today we're going to be looking at something called the Steinitz variation of the two knights defense. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button, click on that notification icon. So here white's going to play the knight attack with knight g5. We're going to have pawn to d5, which is the logical move to defend, e d5, uh, knight to a5, bishop b5 check. This is the Polaro check line, c6, d6 c6, b6, bishop's going to retreat to e2, and then we're going to have pawn to h6. Now, in this position, you have a choice of two moves. You have a choice between knight f3 to retreat the knight and knight h3 to retreat the knight. Now, the Steinitz variation is the move knight h3. Now, the reason we're doing this is because if we were to play the move knight f3, black would be able to play the move pawn to e5 with tempo, and he would be able to gain space in the middle of the board. So quite simply, the move knight h3 is in response to black being able to gain this space with the move pawn to e4 with tempo. So knight h3, even though it looks really anti-instinctual in terms of a move, you know, knights on the rim are dim, uh, it seems like almost a beginner's mistake, was something that Steinitz came up with because he didn't want to give up his center. So this actually has to do with not losing control of the center. So the idea is they can still play e4, but they can't play it with tempo. So let's say that they were to play e4 right here, like let's say e4, this is actually kind of a question mark move. We would play something simple. We could develop knight h3, bishop d6, and then we could play d3. And this position would simply be slight advantage white. After something like e d3, we would have queen d3. All of white's pieces are actually going to develop um, something like castles, bishop f4, takes we could exchange queens knight f4 this would actually be decisive advantage white white is up the clean pawn and black has some terrible pawn structure and he's not doing very well at all so just the fact that he's not able to play this e4 move with tempo makes a huge difference in what difference in white's position um steinitz himself actually essayed this opening uh, um, a few times um one of the more notable times was in his uh, world championship match a game that continued with uh, bishop c5 which is a very common reply to all of this and then we have castles and in that world championship match game uh, after castles kingside pawn to d3 the move knight to d5 was tried by steinitz opponent Shigarin. Uh, back in Havana in the World Championship match in 1892. And uh, that game continued with pawn to c4, uh, knight to e7, uh, king h1. So now you can kind of see Steinitz is finally threatening to uh, redeploy his knight. And of course, the difference here is when the knight finally does re-arrive on the f3 square, um, the e4 square is firmly under control at this point. Steinitz took time to play the move pawn to d3 and make sure that e4 couldn't get played. And that's kind of the main idea of the Steinitz variation. We let the knight hang out on h3, and we just make sure to secure that e4 square. Now, it is true that a lot of times in the Steinitz variation, we do eventually try to at least threaten to reposition our knight with knight to g1 to h3. But of course, the knight will almost always invariably get captured before we ever pull off this transition. So the main idea really behind the Steinitz variation is just to control the e4 square and make sure that we have enough space and that we have enough space for our pieces to maneuver. And of course, that's what Steinitz did in this game. But here he plays king h1, threatening this maneuver. So now, of course, the knight gets snapped off, takes takes, um, knight f5. Uh, he plays pawn to f4. This is another very typical theme. Uh, we'll actually see this. Uh, we'll see Fisher pull off this theme as well um, in Fisher versus Biscayer, which is the very next game we're going to be taking a look at. But we have pawn to f4 here, basically just threatening to develop. Now, here's the critical thing. White in this position is better but not really because he's got an extra pawn. Like if you look at the extra pawn that white has, of course that extra pawn is terrible. But white is actually better because he's got um, slightly less awkward pieces than black, and he also has a bishop pair. And that bishop pair has an open board. And that's the reason that white has an advantage here. Uh, but it, it, it should definitely be noted that black's pieces, especially this knight on a5, are actually very awkward here. So black doesn't have the normal type of advantage of just having more space and having easier piece placement for the pawn like he would in the normal um, knight f3 lines of the two knights defense. We're not seeing that here in the Steinitz variation, and this is kind of what white's trying to do in the Steinitz variation. Uh, but this game continued ef4, bishop f4, we had knight e3 takes takes, knight to c3, and this was actually just decisive advantage white, and this was uh, Steinitz versus Chigarin, uh, you know, world championship match uh, game in 1892. So if we're going back, 
um, let's see some at least slightly more modern um, ways of dealing with this position. Of course, knight d5 didn't work out, but we saw uh, bishop takes h3 um, in a game played between uh, Bobby Fischer and um, Arthur Buskire. That game continued uh, h captures g3. We had bishop, queen, queen d7 attacking the um, h3 pawn, and Fischer just kind of ignored it and played bishop f3. And this is kind of the main idea of this, you know, Steinitz variation, is control that e4 squared. This is the critical thing. And again, white doesn't have an advantage because he's got an extra pawn, so he's not at all worried about losing one of his doubled h pawns. Uh, they're not really that critical to the position. White has an advantage because he has the bishop pair, and he's got a firm grip on certain central squares in the middle. And because this knight on the a5 square and uh, the placement of some of black's pieces are a little awkward. You know, notice both of these pieces are on unanchored squares, and they be they could become loose, they could become captured. So we have queen to um, h3, and then we have uh, knight d2 from Fisher. Now it's interesting to note that other moves were certainly possible here, like bishop g2 was certainly possible. Uh, Fisher kind of uh, gave this move as a possibility, and he thought that maybe queen h4 was a problem, uh, because uh, queen e1 could be met with uh, rook e8, and then on queen takes a5, knight g4 was pretty strong for, for black. But... It should be noted that this queen e1, queen a5 line is by no means forced. Uh, we can simply play queen f3 with slight advantage white. So bishop to g2 followed by queen f3 was certainly a reasonable alternative, and this should have been considered a uh, slight advantage white. And there were actually a lot of twists and turns in this game where I really kind of felt like Fisher went wrong, and um, he certainly could have improved, and uh, certainly a lot of places where um, Arthur Vizcaira went wrong. And this is kind of something that you'll see in a lot of these Steinitz variation games, it's really easy to get a lot of these things wrong because um, a lot of these moves are really anti-intuitional. A lot of these variations are very dependent on having very good preparation. Um, you know, one side is sacrificed a pawn, another side has more space or whatever. It's highly imbalanced positions, and then you have one side attacking, one side defending. So not everything is going to be following general principles. So you're going to have to play some very uh, interesting ideas, let's just say. So, yeah, correct was something like queen f3, slight edge white, and, yeah, bishop g2 was fine. Uh, the move that Fisher played was also fine, knight d2, and, of course, this move is also very principled, so, I mean, principles do still matter, of course. I mean, after me going on that big rant about how, you know, it's not, as, as principles aren't as important, you just have to play the right idea, um, it, it, they're still important um, in the aspect of just defending critical squares, especially the e4 square. And that's a theme that gets just repeated over and over and over again in the Steinitz variation. The main idea behind the initial knight retreat to h3 in the first place is to control e4, and that kind of remains the main idea in uh, the Steinitz variation as more and more moves get played. So we have rook a d8, we have bishop g2, uh, we have uh, queen f5, uh, we're going to have queen e1 here. You know, Fisher just kind of liked this idea, uh, even though queen f3 was probably, again, best. Uh, just queen f3 is probably just major advantage white. Um, he just firmly controls e4. And there's not a whole lot black can do about it. Like after bishop f after queen f3, bishop f3, this should just be considered major advantage white without a whole lot of fanfare. This would have been the easiest way for Fisher to consolidate his position into a major advantage. Um, instead, we had queen e1, which is kind of Fisher's initial idea. He wanted to put this um, kind of x-ray pressure on the a5 knight because he felt like the a5 knight was awkward, so he wanted to attack the loose knight. Um, this makes a lot of sense from, from like a tactician perspective, but it wasn't the most accurate move. We had rook e8, we had knight e4, uh, bishop b6 simply defends the knight, and actually art uh, is doing pretty good here. Uh, Biscayer actually should have some sort of advantage here. After knight f6, queen f6, we have king h1, uh, pawn to c5, all this is well and good. And then queen c3 is given an exclamation mark, I think, by Fisher. But actually, uh, probably queen c3 is a mistake. Probably queen e4 is a little bit stronger. Like, queen e4 should just be close to equal. Like, queen e4, rook d4, queen f3. Again, just back to this idea. You know, just, just trade queens, control e4, and we should have at least an equal position here. Maybe even slight advantage white. Uh, but instead we see queen c3, and then uh, knight c6 was all well and good. Pawn to f4. Uh, knight d4 was good. Queen c4 was good. And then we just kind of have a, a stake here in a couple of moves. Queen g6 is fine. Um, pawn to c3. And then um, Art should have just dove right in here with knight c2. Um, and the engines think that this is actually just advantage uh, black. The engines are thinking knight c2. White has nothing better than shuffling this rook, and then simply takes on f4, takes on f4, rook d3. Should be decisive advantage black. Um, 
after the move that got played, um, which was the move pawn to c3, and then we have knight f5, we had bishop, uh, we had f, f takes e5 in the game, and then followed by bishop f4, and then followed by bishop to e4. And this ended up being um, a decisive position for white after this super question mark move, rook b2, and then we have bishop e5, which is just winning material. The knight on f5 hangs, and uh, white is essentially winning. And this is kind of what happens in a lot of these positions. This bishop pair is just a super powerful force in the position. Again, to reiterate, white isn't better in these positions because of the extra pawn. Um, at, at, in the Steinitz variation, white is better because he's going to have that bishop pair. As soon as black plays bishop takes h3, gh3, white's going to be better because he has that bishop pair, not because of the extra pawn. So anyway, so that was uh, Bobby Fischer versus Arthur Ruskier. So that should give us kind of some idea what to do about these variations where black plays bishop c5 and on an early bishop takes h3. We see this game from William Steinitz. We see this game from Bobby Fischer. And this gives us an idea kind of what paths to go down. So what do we do if going all the way back here, um, they decide to play this a little bit differently. They leave the knight on h3 for a certain amount of time, and they don't play bishop c5. They play something a little bit more uh, passive, a little bit different. They play something like uh, bishop d6. So it, another interesting side note is, like, if they play something really direct, like g5, like d3, again, to cover the e4 square, uh, g4, knight back to g1, bishop c5, knight c3, queen b6, we would have knight a4 holding everything together, these positions are supposed to be major advantage white. So the super direct path of just going after this knight and playing bishop c5, queen b6 doesn't work tactically. And that is kind of important to know that your position isn't falling apart just really directly. So knight h3, we're going to have bishop d6, just something kind of, you know, straightforward, d3. So again, following the general rule, covering the e4 square, you know, just kind of preparing to pile on that e4 square with knight c3, um, d3, possibly bishop f3, just putting more and more pressure on that e4 square. This is the main idea. So we're following here a game uh, Duda versus uh, Ding Liren uh, played uh, played back in 2021. So very recent game. But again, much like the Fisher versus Biscayer game, a game riddled with mistakes. Tons and tons of errors from both players. So just to give you an idea how difficult some of these positions are to play. But the mistakes, again, kind of revolved around them just kind of ignoring the basic procedure of really it was critical for white to control the e4 square. But there's a lot going on in the position, so it seems like white needs to do other stuff, but really he doesn't. He needs, needs to control e4. So we have castles, castles, we have c5, bishop f3. So, so far so good. Um, you know, dude is getting the brief. This is what he needs to be doing. He needs to be controlling e4. We have rook b8, we have king h1. So now there's kind of this threat of knight to g1. Uh, bishop to c7 gets played, and now white plays knight g1. And this is wrong. And this is something that you need to realize. The idea in this position is not to to redeploy this knight with knight to g1. It seems like that's the idea, but it's not the idea. The main idea is to control e4. So that's the critical part of the brief in the position. That's the critical thing that you have to do. If your pawns get doubled, even with your king castled over here, you don't care. You have a bishop. It controls the light squares, as we saw in the Fischer game, as we saw in the Steinitz game. This is fine. If your pawns get doubled, you'll have an advantage because you have uh, the bishop pair and you're going to have an open position for those bishops. That's what's going on. That's okay. But if you lose control of that e4 square, you could have a very serious problem. And that's actually what happened in this game. As soon as he played knight to g1, that allows the move queen d6. There's an immediate threat here of pawn to e4. And there isn't a great way to meet that threat anymore. And that's kind of a very serious problem. What white needed to do was play this immediate knight c3, and then on queen d6, play knight e4. And now we're completely blockading this. There's no way that this pawn is going to get pushed. If we exchange, we have you know ways to deal with that. We're, we're, we're controlling this square enough times. We're not going to get into trouble. Here, white is just going to be completely equal. Everything is okay. That's not what happened. What happened was we had knight g1, we had queen d6, and then g3 is forced. So now we have to weaken our king side. And then we have knight back to c6, which is also a question mark move. Probably major advantage black is just something like rook to d8. Just again, making this threat of pawn to e4 when we can't play d takes e4 because we're going to be losing material at some point. So this is correct. He didn't do this. Um, instead, he played uh, knight to c6. And then we have knight a3. Again, Going after the c4 square, 
instead of going after the e4 square. So again, knight a3 is a mistake, but it's kind of like an honest one. He's He sees a weak square that looks juicy. He wants to go after the c4 square. He wants to go after it with tempo, and he wants to attack the queen. But it's still not the critical part of what's going on. The critical part of what's going on is even with this pawn on g3, seemingly safeguarding his king's position, it's still just more critical to go after this e4 square and try to defend it. So he should have played knight c3, and that would have been uh, pretty much, or actually more to the point, he should have just played knight d2, and that would have been pretty close to equality. He could have aimed at both of these squares with knight d2. He's prepared to play either move. So knight a3 was incorrect, but then of course so was knight d4. Again, just rook d8, major advantage black. Uh, we have knight d4 here, knight c4, queen back to a6, bishop g2. e4 finally does get played. We have bishop e3, we have rook d8. And now, here's kind of the eventual critical idea, is after d takes e4, knight takes e4, white plays the amazing mistake, uh, just rook, rook e1, which is like a super double question mark move. The position is actually still unclear after, for example, f3. Um, this position should still be unclear, and black should not be winning in this position. After rook e1, uh, black is completely winning after the move queen d5, and um, unfortunately Duda had to resign in this position. Uh, the move knight to g3 check is a th is a threat, and it can't be met. Um, if knight g3 check, hg3, queen g2 is made. And there's not a great move to meet it. There just there isn't a good move here, and uh, white is basically losing this position. So that's kind of the critical thing here, is like when you're preparing this position with white, uh, your focus needs to be on controlling that e4 square. So even this position, this position can firmly be within your repertoire. And instead of playing this uh, lemon knight to g1, you can simply play the move knight to c3. And you should expect to have a very reasonable game from here. You can follow up with knight g1 on the next move after the move knight to c3. Your position should be perfectly acceptable uh, with the white pieces. You can meet the move queen d6 with knight to e4. White should have an advantage in these positions. And that's kind of, um, you know, roundabouts uh, how you play um, the Steinitz variation. An another kind of important thing to note is if in these positions they go after taking this knight right away, this is something a lot of players are afraid of after, say, bishop takes h3, g takes h3, um, something like, say, uh, bishop to c5, d3, uh, we'll say castles, knight c3. You don't really have to be worried about them going after this pawn at any point. If they ever attack it directly, you can always just play the move bishop to g4, and you're going to be a-ok -okay in these positions, and everything's going to be fine. You're just going to have, you know, some sort of advantage um, just in terms of an extra pawn. If you give your bishop pair back up and you get an extra pawn for it, that's good. If you don't, you're just going to have a bishop pair and you're going to have an advantage that way. So anyway, so that's um, how you play the Steinitz variation. Those are the ideas. Um, those are the concepts. Uh, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. Thank you very much for watching.